October 6th, 1939. When Germany invaded Poland, everyone thought that a successful invasion would take months, even considering the might of the German army. Then the USSR also invaded, and now, just one month from the war's beginning, the Polish armed forces resistance is at an end. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Warsaw fell to the Germans, as both they and the Soviets continued their invasions of Poland. Germany and the USSR signed a treaty of friendship that partitioned Poland between them, and Adolf Hitler set his sights on Western Europe. Oddly enough, as of this week, Western Europe kind of now includes Poland. On September 30th, a new Polish government is set up in exile in Paris. Władysław Raczkiewicz is the new president and General Władysław Sikorski, commander-in-chief of the armed forces and prime minister. Around 100,000 Polish troops managed to escape into either Hungary, Romania, or the Baltics, despite the efforts of the Russians and Germans. Now, I mentioned two weeks ago that the Polish government had crossed into Romania and been interned. That was because by issuing a proclamation for Poles to continue the fight and head to France, they were technically a belligerent regime on Romanian territory. And when the Germans protested, the Romanians complied with international law rather than risk German intervention. With now former President Ignacy Moschitsky under house arrest, there was a real risk that Poland would be stuck without a government and a German puppet regime would be recognized by neutral nations. Moschitsky nominates Ratchkiewicz and the first Paris meeting of the government in exile is October 2nd. Bucharest itself is flooded with Polish refugees, but most Romanian officials are pretty well disposed toward them. To leave Romania, though, you need a passport. So the Polish embassy is working overtime and an exodus of Poles towards Yugoslavia or across the Black Sea to points further is beginning. On October 5th, Ratchkiewicz sends a message to the Polish people. It is not the first time in our history that the head of state and the national government has had to take refuge from the motherland which has been overrun by the enemy. In the course of a thousand years, we have defended more than once our existence and Christian civilization against the thirst for conquest and oppression by Germany and against her barbarous oriental ally. I profoundly believe that the heroic contribution of Poland to the Anglo-French coalition war will not be in vain. It will result in final victory. And speaking of the Orient and victory, those two words are quite topical this week. In China, the first battle of Changsha ends this week. This is the first major battle of the Second Sino-Japanese War, the war between China and Japan that's been going on the past two years to fall within the scope of this channel. That war is considered by many to be part of the Second World War, though Japan's not allied with Germany or anything. But the war in Europe and the war in East Asia are affecting each other as the Soviets are dealing with both the Japanese and the Germans. After a couple years of fighting, the Chinese war has become sort of a stalemate. But the Chinese army had just had a big morale boost when the Russians and Mongolians badly defeated the Japanese at the end of August, as we saw last month, and a successful attack on the Chinese now would in turn be a much needed morale boost for the Japanese army. And the Soviets and Japanese have recently signed an armistice. So the Japanese could put them out of the picture for the time being and focus on trying to beat the Chinese and then installing a puppet government in central China, much as they have already done in Manchuria. Japanese forces were converging on Changsha by mid-September and the battle began the 17th. Side note here, the attacks would include poison gas. The Japanese have not signed the Geneva Protocol. By September 23rd, the Chinese had been driven from the Xinjiang River region and Changsha had been surrounded on three sides. By the end of September, advanced Japanese troops had reached the outskirts of the city, but they had taken heavy casualties and were in danger of overstretching their supply lines, which were being constantly harassed and were possibly in danger of being cut altogether. So they withdrew. The Chinese pursue them straight away and begin a general counterattack October 3rd. Japanese General Yasuji Okamura orders the whole offensive called off, but the Chinese shoot down the plane carrying the order. By the week's end, the Japanese are being destroyed and are in full retreat northward over the Miluo River. Within days, the Chinese will have retaken the territory they lost in Hunan, Hubei, and Jiangxi provinces. Changsha 
is the first major city that has managed to repel the Japanese advances. As you can imagine, it is a big boost for the Chinese nationalists, and the Japanese are foiled for the time being from consolidating their gains in southern China. But in Europe, the Polish army's resistance is coming to an end as the Germans and Russians consolidated their gains. Admiral Unrug's garrison on Hell Peninsula finally surrenders to the Germans. On the 30th, a series of landmines are detonated. This nearly cuts off the peninsula from the mainland. Unrug is determined to fight, even after the surrender of Warsaw last week. But as October rolls in, he realizes it is futile. The garrison surrenders October 2nd. The last significant Polish units surrender this week, some the 3rd near Wutsk, and then the Polish Independent Operation Group the 6th after the Battle of Kotsk. The Germans have taken 700,000 prisoners of war and the Soviets 200,000. Polish casualties are heavy, an estimated 70,000 killed and 133,000 wounded. The Germans have 10,000 dead and 30,000 wounded. The available casualty estimates from the Soviet invasion are chilling. The Red Army, is said to have lost 996 men killed and 2,002 wounded, while the Poles are said to have suffered 50,000 fatalities without any figure for the wounded. Such a figure can perhaps only be explained by executions. I'm going to throw in another quote here about the German invasion that's pretty interesting. Although tank units have played a notable part in the campaign, it is interesting to note that the contemporary German official appreciations lay more stress on the traditional style infantry battles. The tank forces are seen at this stage, except by enthusiasts like Guderian, as little more than useful auxiliaries who can help the infantry do the real work. On October 4th, Adolf Hitler issues an amnesty order to German troops who have killed prisoners or civilians, presuming that they have acted from bitterness over atrocities committed by Poles. The next day, the 5th, at the victory parade in Warsaw, Hitler says to the assembled foreign journalists, gentlemen, you have seen the ruins of Warsaw. Let that be a warning to those statesmen in London and Paris who still think of continuing the war. Okay, that is to journalists. The day after that, as the week ends, Hitler has a major speech to the Reichstag. He talks then of his desire for peace with Britain and France. He says he has no war aims against them and up to now has only corrected the unjust Versailles Treaty. He blames warmongers like Churchill for the current state of affairs and even calls for a conference to resolve their differences. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain says that to consider this would be to forgive Germany for its aggression. He and French Prime Minister Edouard Daladier tell Hitler, no way, Jose. Okay, they don't actually say Jose, but you know what I mean. There is a conference that takes place this week, though. The second Pan-American conference is held the second, with 21 nations participating. They establish a 300-mile, 480 kilometers, security zone off the American coast. Any act of war in this zone against anyone will be interpreted as a hostile attack on America. And the war at sea is, in fact, heating up. On the 30th, the German pocket battleship Graf Spee sinks its first merchant ship, the British freighter Clement, off the coast of Brazil. On October 5th, eight British and French hunting groups are formed to look for the Graf Spee. Now, the other pocket battleship on the loose, the Deutschland, sinks the Stone Gate in the neutrality zone. Deutschland will also seize an American ship as a prize of war. This turns out to be a big mistake. Combined with the Polish invasion, this really helps turn American public opinion not just against the Germans, but against the Neutrality Acts, which banned loans or the sale of munitions to belligerents. Early next month, this will result in President Franklin Roosevelt getting a new Neutrality Act passed that allows the arms trade with belligerent nations, read Britain and France, on a cash and carry basis. The recipients will have to use their own ships, pay immediately in cash, still no loans, and assume all transportation risk. American shipping is forbidden from entering the war zone. And here are some notes to end the week. On the second, the Soviets threaten an occupation if they don't get to use military bases in Latvia. Three days later, the Latvians and the USSR sign a 10-year mutual assistance pact. The Soviets can have 25,000 men on Latvian bases. This follows a similar agreement signed with the Estonians last week. Lithuania is now pressured to do likewise, but they are reluctant. And as the week ends, the Finns mobilize their standing army forces. A bit more about why next week. 
So this week is now at its end, as is Polish armed resistance to the invaders. Well, in Poland, that is, because there is now a Polish government in Paris to continue the fight. Chinese resistance scores a big victory over the Japanese, and American resistance to the German naval campaign grows stronger. And Hitler issued an amnesty for those of his men who had killed civilians or POWs. We've seen that there had been a lot of that this first month of the war. You may think, though, that the issuing of such an amnesty means that those killings are only in the past tense. They are not. They very much continue day after day after day. If you'd like to understand more of why the U.S. is on the sidelines until now, you can watch our Between Two Wars episode about the origins of U.S. isolationism in the 1920s and 30s right here. Please join the Time Ghost Army and support the effort to make even more content like this. Every dollar does count. See you next time. Mm -hmm.